A few years ago, uh, my co-author for uh, this paper, Dirk Besmer, Steve Keen, and I uh, began to write on trying to explain the two most characteristic features of our time. Uh, and that is, in the first place, uh, the financial bubble that was building up, uh, real estate loans, uh, the stock market. And secondly, the post-bubble uh, period, the austerity, the debt deflation, uh, the time when it comes to paying down all of the debts that were increasing uh, what was thought of as overall economic activity. Uh, when we begin to try to statistically illustrate our model, uh, we found that uh, the national income and product accounts, the NIPA, uh, and uh, the Federal Reserve uh, flow of fund statements uh, had to be very severely modified because any accounting statement, uh, any accounting format, is an economic theory. Uh, the heads of the columns uh, are basically uh, the categories that are used in economic theory. And the problem is that the economic theory underlying uh, the national income accounting was not very helpful towards explaining what was going on. And in fact, if you study the history of economic thought, you realize that uh, this was deliberate and intentional. The, uh, for the last 100 years, uh, there has been a revolution against classical economics uh, and against taking into account the fact that there is any such thing as unearned income uh, and that really there is no such thing as an economic surplus, that it's all part of something amorphous called uh, economic activity. Uh, so the problem is, how do we uh, make a distinction between income and activity and investment and lending and, that actually adds to economic growth and uh, activities that use up the surplus, that are extractive? that are predatory. Uh, and in fact, this is what classical economics was all about. Uh, from the 13th century, when the scholastic uh, churchmen talked about the theory of just price, they were developing what was, in effect, the labor uh, theory of value. Uh, when they said that uh, bankers were allowed to recover the uh, remuneration for their honest labor. Uh, but the complement of this uh, was uh, there was some element of price that was not value, some element of price that was purely a residual of the economic privileges that were uh, essentially bequeathed by the feudal period of Europe to the post-feudal period. Uh, and there were two main categories that the classical economists, Adam Smith, uh, the physiocrats, uh, Ricardo, John Stuart Mill and Marx uh, also talked about. And uh, the first category were the landlords, uh, the hereditary class that had conquered uh, the lands of England and other countries and extracted economic rent. That was, uh, it was to isolate this rent that uh, Canet drew up the tableau economique uh, that was the first national income accounts uh, by the physiocrats. And uh, this was viewed as absolutely uh, uh, radical at the time, uh, Canet's uh, and the physiocrats' ideas were reprinted uh, in pamphlets passed throughout France. The whole idea of uh, Canet's national income account was to isolate the economic rent by French landlords to show that, look, this is why uh, we are not able to have a real uh, circulation uh, of uh, uh, of income, and this is why France is being impoverished, because so much of the uh, product and the prices of industry and agriculture are paid uh, to the uh, to the rentier class. Uh, the other class, of course, was the financial class, and the financial class uh, somehow got left out of economic accounting for a number of reasons. Uh, in the first place. Uh, the finance is not a factor of production. 
Uh, you hear a lot about uh, presu the th presumed three factors of production, uh, labor, land, and capital. Well, we know that labor earns wages. We know that uh, industrial capital, uh, fixed investment, makes profits. Uh, land isn't really a factor of production because land is a, pr a right to extract rent. So that could be either viewed as a privilege or a factor of production. And of course, also government. Uh, it, it became in the 20th century a factor of production. Uh, already in the 19th century, through its vast expenditure on uh, public uh, infrastructure, roads, canals, public transport, and in fact, the capital investment of government uh, in the economy is larger than that of industry. And in fact, uh, the uh, rentier sector, uh, the uh, landlord, the uh, volume of economic rent uh, is much larger uh, than that of industry. And yet, uh, it was uh, this which uh, became the focus of classical uh, economics. And uh, once uh, you had a John Stuart Mill uh, Henry George and Karl Marx uh, talking about uh, the unearned increment uh, in fictitious capital, a term that was used both on the right wing of the spectrum by Henry George and on the left wing by uh, the Marxists, uh, you had a kind of crisis in economic theory and this crisis was political. Uh, there were uh, reformers emerging uh, among the American uh, institutionalists and uh, they wanted to use uh, the classical analysis of price as a means of regulating uh, the railroad rates, the public utility rates, uh, the privatized uh, monopolies uh, in the United States, such as the electric uh, uh, and gas companies, to do very much what uh, the medieval uh, churchmen had tried to do with the banks, to keep prices in line with, uh, with the actual costs of production. Well, in the late 19th century, there was a revolution against this, and it was largely led by John B uh, Bates Clark in the United States, and uh, he claimed that there is no such thing as unearned income. All income is productive. Everybody earns whatever they have. They earn all the wealth they have, so that by definition, whatever uh, the bankers earn, the landlord earns, and the monopolist earns is uh, a return for providing an economic service. Uh, and that's what's called the service economy. Well, what we've tried to do, and I'll run through the charts uh, uh, later, uh, is to isolate that part of the uh, national income accounts that is actually uh, productive and part of uh, what people think about in the textbook is the real economy, uh, from that part which is not the real economy, but is something external and extractive and wrapped around the real economy. And that is the set of uh, the debt overhead uh, and the, uh, the monopoly rights or the uh, property rights uh, that actually are not factors of production at all, but merely a right to receive, uh, to extract income. Uh, we can almost uh, reconstruct the national income accounts from looking at the average uh, worker's budget and you can see what's missing uh, in the national accounts. If you take uh, the American uh, workers' budget, 40% uh, typically goes for housing, uh, another 10% uh, for debt payments. So half of the uh, uh, workers' take-home pay goes to pay the, uh, uh, the, the financial sector. Uh, about 15% uh, is withheld from paychecks. Uh, essentially uh, for Social Security and health care uh, to be lent to the government uh, so that the government can cut the taxes on uh, the higher incomes. And there are about 10% uh, other taxes that the wage earner pays. So 75% of the paycheck goes before there's any amount of payment for goods and services. Now compare that to the picture that we would get in the national income and product accounts. Uh, you have underlying it uh, basically what you're all taught in uh, beginning economics, the Say's Law, that production uh, creates its own uh, uh, demand, that uh, the employers pay wages to the workers, the workers buy uh, what they produce, and that way there's a circular flow in the economy that somehow <coughs> keeps uh, everything uh, in balance. If producers uh, produce something that people don't want to buy, obviously uh, that's not sold, but on a macroeconomic uh, 
uh, framework, the idea is that what people produce has to be bought. Consumption equals production. That's the assumption underlying the national income accounts. It doesn't explain the bubble economy, and it doesn't explain today's austerity. So the question is, what is left out of this kind of accounting? Well, uh, one uh, part of the uh, solution is an article that the three of us are publishing on uh, what is uh, the uh, estimate of total spending. Spending is not simply income that people earn. It's also the increase or the decrease in debt. Uh, the average uh, wages in the United States since the late 1970s have actually gone down steadily. But consumption increased, and it increased for two reasons. Number one, consumers went increasingly into debt. Uh, and so they were able to, to uh, uh, consume not only by spending their take-home pay, uh, the 25% of it that they didn't have to pay to the, uh, uh, fire, the finance, insurance, and real estate, the fire sector, uh, but also uh, they had capital gains on the houses. Uh, and uh, in fact, it was the uh, inflation of housing prices uh, that uh, Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, said, look, it's, uh, you can borrow against your house, you should treat the house inflation as savings. And as head of the Fed, uh, the, uh, Alan Greenspan reduced interest rates steadily from uh, the 20% that they were in 1980 at the prime rate to down to a quarter of 1% today <coughs> in the succession, uh, Ben Bernanke. Uh, this decrease in uh, interest rates enabled a larger and larger debt to be uh, capitalized on the basis of a houses rental value, a uh, wage earner's uh, uh, surplus as to what he could pay, or corporate profits. Uh, so uh, people began to borrow against their houses. About uh, Greenspan estimated that about 20% of the uh, inflated ha housing price uh, was uh, spent as consumer loans, including paying the interest on the money that, uh, uh, that families would borrow. In some years, uh, in the 2004-2005 uh, period, uh, workers who had, say, a $200,000 house uh, would be earning maybe $30,000 a year, but the value of their house would go up by just as much, by $30,000 or even more. So the average American family was making more off the increased value of the house than they actually earned in wages. So we wanted to add to the national income accounts the, uh, the capital gains. And in fact, uh, there's a term in the English language that's used to describe this, uh, total returns. And total returns are current income uh, plus capital gains. That became uh, the aim of investors, uh, of real estate investors, and of corporate raiders. Uh, if you were an absentee investor in uh, real estate, uh, you would seek to go to a bank and buy as much property as you could. Uh, the motto was rent is for paying interest. Uh, the real estate developer, Donald Trump or uh, whoever else, uh, would take uh, whatever the rental value of the building was uh, and property, and uh, they'd uh, pay uh, that uh, to the bank as interest. They were after the capital gain. So the banking sector, the financial sector, received the interest in the economy, and the capital, the uh, owner would get the capital gain. Same things with uh, uh, with houses. Uh, the financial sector advised uh, homeowners to essentially be uh, Donald Trump's in miniature, make uh, a lot of money off the house. Uh, the problem is that whereas Donald Trump would uh, organize uh, each building as a separate corporate entity, uh, the homeowner was usually personally liable. So uh, after you had uh, the housing price uh, bubble uh, peak in 2008, ever since uh, the prices have gone down, but the debts remain in place, and one quarter of American real estate is now in negative equity. In other words, the uh, mortgage is higher than uh, the current market price. So uh, that explains part of the uh, debt deflation. The other part is a, uh, it's time for most of the population to begin paying down the debt. So instead of uh, uh, bar uh, adding and sustaining their living standards, by borrowing, all of a sudden, 
the uh, wage earners in America have to pay down uh, the credit card debt, which is followed by a few trillion dollars. They've had to pay off student loans. They've had to pay down bank loans. Uh, and they're falling in negative equity. So uh, we essentially it's necessary to depict this by adjusting the national income accounts to separate the finance, insurance, and real estate sector from the rest of the economy so that you can, uh, and technically, one should add monopolies on others, uh, so that you should uh, uh, see what is the real growth and what is the unreal growth. The whole purpose in describing uh, the real economy or production uh, and consumption is to isolate that part of the economy that is not uh, wages and profits. You could say that uh, if you subtract from the national income account the sum of wages and profits, uh, setting aside the uh, government sector for now, then you have uh, the balance, which is what the classical economists group together, <coughs> economic rent. Now, there are two ways to expand uh, government, uh, expand uh, spending power. One way is for the governments uh, to run a deficit. Uh, that's what uh, the United States has been doing. That's why the United States Depression is not as bad as the European Depression, uh, because the United States at least is spending money into the economy. Uh, the other way, as I said, is for banks to extend, uh, cred uh, extend credit. However, there's, uh, uh, banks create uh, credit and inject uh, purchasing power in a different way than governments do. When governments spend, uh, in the past, it's been to uh, buy goods and services. It's been for social programs, it's been to pay social security, uh, welfare, and also uh, military spending, uh, it usually for products that employ labor. Uh, bank loans are for an entirely different purpose. Uh, the Ang uh, since World War I, the Anglo-Dutch-American uh, principle of banking is said, you lend against collateral. That means that banks lend against uh, real estate. 80% of bank loans in America and England and Scandinavia are uh, mortgage loans. Uh, or you lend against uh, companies that, are, say, a corporate raider will take over and uh, do what uh, a real estate speculator will do. Whereas the real estate investor will say the rent is for paying interest to buy uh, to the bank to get the loan to buy the property to make a capital gain. Uh, the corporate raider will say profits and court cash flow uh, are for paying interest. They will uh, go to uh, bondholders and uh, uh, buy out companies uh, and pay. Uh, so the banks uh, make loans against property, against stocks and bonds, and the effect has been to inflate uh, asset prices. Uh, and the source of the inflation in the economy of Europe and America is not government spending, it's bank credit. Uh, and that's what's left up out of account. I'm going to run uh, through uh, the charts uh, very quickly now. Uh, uh, there, uh, until about uh, uh, 19, uh, the early 1980s, credit was linked into the real productive uh, economy. Uh, basically, most credit was linked to the uh, uh, pro production, uh, consumption. Uh, it was fairly healthy. Uh, the change came uh, in the in the 1980s when uh, banks began to lend increasingly uh, for corporate raiders uh, to real estate investors. Uh, almost uh, all of the uh, credit has been to the uh, real estate sector and the speculators, and that is what is inflated housing prices. Uh, if the root of the inflation is increased budgets in the United States is largely the cost of housing, this is not a result of government deficit spending. It's a result of bank credit inflating the price of buying a house uh, so that if uh, you, you purchase a house, uh, the new buyer has to go deeply into debt uh, for the bank and the value of a house is whatever a bank will lend. Uh, that's basically the new uh, principle of pricing. And it's the difference between uh, price uh, and intrinsic value. And this distinction between price and value that was the core of all classical economic theory, it was eradicated uh, by the turn of the 20th century because they found that if you draw a distinction between price and value, between productive and unproductive loans, then all of a sudden you isolate the unearned uh, increment the free lunch.
Uh, and the very the leading principle of the Chicago School, the lobbyist for the bankers, is uh, there is no such thing as the free lunch. Our statistics show that the economy is all about getting a free lunch. It's all about earned in, unearned income. It's all about the rentiers. Uh, and uh, the, if the statistics are designed to prevent us or to make it very difficult for us to actually uh, find out and quantify this, uh, but we're trying. Uh, you can see the, this is the chart uh, that shows how credit is decoupled. Uh, you look at the very end, you see a vast uh, uh, amount of credit stock uh, while uh, the national income is falling. Uh, what you have is two things that have happened. <coughs> Uh, remember when I said there are two sources of income uh, uh, of, uh, injecting purchasing power into the economy? One is uh, government spending. Since uh, 2008, you've had the largest increase in public debt in America, in American history. This has not been for spending into the economy. Thirteen trillion dollars has been a bailout to the banks. Instead of rescuing the economy from the uh, recession by spending money, the government is giving it to the banks on the principle that no banker should take a loss, that the economy will fall apart if we don't support the rentiers. This is very much like uh, Thomas Malthus uh, argued uh, with reference to uh, the physiocrats and the uh, national income. He said, wait a minute, landlords play a very productive role. Where would uh, consumption levels be if we didn't uh, pay our coachmen uh, and our uh, people who make soups for us and our servants? Uh, th uh, this is essentially what the fire sector is claiming. Where, where would the economy be uh, without us uh, doing what uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and other banks do? Uh, we, uh, you can, if you look at uh, the growth in uh, bank credit, as I said, 80% of bank loans are mortgage loans. Uh, others are uh, for uh, corporate takeovers. Uh, not exactly what is uh, easily fit into Say's law. Uh, doesn't fit into that circular flow. Uh, so uh, any analysis of uh, the national income basic accounts really should focus on how did the financial sector rise to power? How has finance today taken the position that landlords had in the 18th and 19th century when they were taking most of the rent? Uh, when they were the object of uh, uh, the physiocrats, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, all urging that the tax system not be levied on uh, excise taxes on, uh, that had to be paid by labor and industry, uh, but uh, levied on, uh, uh, on the landlords. Uh, this was this central uh, concern of uh, classical economics has lost its uh, impact throughout the 20th century as two-thirds of homeowners in the English-speaking countries and about 80% in Scandinavia, uh, as two-thirds of the population own their own homes. So obviously, uh, they have become landlords in miniature, and somehow there is no distinction between uh, user occupancy, home ownership, and uh, absentee ownership, which is where most of the money is. Uh, the value of New York City real estate <coughs> alone is larger than uh, that of all of the plant and equipment in the United States. Just to give you a sense of perspective, you wouldn't know it from looking at the uh, national income accounts. Uh, we have here uh, fixed investment is falling. Uh, the problem is uh, that banks don't do what uh, textbooks draw a picture of. Uh, textbooks will have a picture of a bank making a loan to a factory and happy workers walking in with lunch boxes. That's not what banks do. Uh, they uh, only lend against property already in place or companies already in place. In principle, the stock market was supposed to uh, uh, be a vehicle to raise capital investment for uh, the, uh, what was going to employ labor, but the stock market since 1980 has also turned extractive, and uh, uh, it's become a vehicle for uh, uh, leveraged buyouts uh, to replace stock with debt. And the uh, volume of stock has uh, gone way down since the 1980s, been replaced with debt, loading industry uh, down with debt. Uh, one of the results is an uh, enormous sucking upward of the uh, national income away from wages and profits, away from the industrial economy, into finance. The financial sector does not call this a parasitic economy, they call it the service economy or the post-industrial economy. But it actually is a, a neo-feudal economy. 
uh, it is a reversion to uh, to what emerged from the Middle Ages when uh, the landlords and the monopolists uh, and the bankers were taking all of the surplus, leaving the rest of the economy uh, on a subsistence basis. And that's the position uh, that you're, see you're seeing in Greece, Latvia. Uh, it's the implicit uh, aim of the austerity policies that you have uh, today. Uh, I have uh, the overall uh, model uh, that I've done uh, right here. I was supposed to build this up uh, slowly, but if you look at producing consumers, uh, this is basically the Sayes Law area here. Uh, you also have the government paying into the economy, but wrapped around the whole economy is the fire sector. Uh, the way uh, the, uh, the, fi the fire sector, the bank financial sector provides credit to the uh, producers, but it also receives some uh, interest. And uh, because the credit that it creates on its uh, electronic keyboards uh, has interest, uh, it takes out much more than it puts in. That's what explains the uh, sucking up uh, of the economy. The policy conclusions uh, of this analysis are the reasons why uh, it's not adopted uh, by most governments. One policy conclusion is that the bank bailouts will not help. Uh, uh, ben Bernanke's helicopter, you talk, uh, he's known as Helicopter Ben because he said the solution to uh, a depression is for the Federal Reserve to create money and drop it over the economy. But his helicopter only stops over Wall Street. It doesn't go over the rest of the economy. All of this money has been a bank bailout. He hasn't been writing down the debt. They haven't been using the money to write down the negative equity. For one trillion dollars, the government could have paid off uh, all of the negative equity and the mortgage uh, uh, de uh, defaults. Uh, it could have uh, kept the financial system going. Instead, it created 13 trillion because there are many uh, uh, bankers that had placed bets on which way interest would go. The economy's been turning away from a productive economy into an arbitrage economy, where the idea is if you can borrow at less than 1% interest, you can buy anything yielding a larger return than 1%. And the return, remember, is not only a profit rate uh, or corporate cash flow rate of uh, over uh, uh, one percent. Uh, it's also the that rate plus uh, the capital gains and the governments uh, by coming in and only buying bonds uh, and other uh, securities from the banks guarantees to support the market for bonds uh, and thereby support the market for assets, not to support the real economy. So uh, our analysis shows that the government bailout uh, problems are simply uh, supporting uh, the price of property as if this somehow helps the economy. As if it helps the economy for workers to go into a 30-year lifetime of debt in order to afford the mortgage, to pay the bank, uh, and somehow it would be a disaster if they paid a smaller proportion, uh, such as the 20% that Germans pay uh, for their housing, that this would be a disaster for the U.S. economy. Uh, if you have a national income account that doesn't draw the distinction uh, between uh, paying a high uh, uh, pay, uh, part of your salary to rentiers and a low part, then something is missing in uh, the national account statements. Uh, you have uh, one political uh, application of this in the presidential debate in America uh, earlier uh, this week when you had uh, Mitt Romney accuse uh, China of being a currency manipulator. Uh, in reality, China's balance of payments is in balance. Uh, why does it have low cost of production? Well, its uh, workers do not have to pay rents, uh, such as uh, the $4,000 per month that is now the average rent in Manhattan. Uh, they don't have to pay uh, for uh, the public uh, utilities uh, that are not privatized, but are provided uh, freely or subsidized uh, by the government. In other words, China is doing exactly what made the American economy and the German economies so rich in the late 19th century. Uh, the idea of uh, basic infrastructure and basic monopolies is for the government to provide roads, railroads, public transportation, water and sewer, power, and education, especially at as low a price as possible to minimize the cost of doing business. This was why the idea of the critique of the rentiers was not only a left-wing uh, project, not only socialist, it was taught in the business schools of the United States 
as a means of making the U.S. economy more competitive than others by having public enterprise uh, essentially uh, Take, build the Erie Canal, build uh, other, uh, subsidize uh, the railroads and be able to undersell other economies. That's what uh, basically the theory of economic rent was for the European economists and for the American economists uh, to cut the costs. Uh, today's national income accounting and the policy is aimed at maximizing the cost of doing business. Uh, we have here an example of uh, uh, why the bailouts are not going to help uh, uh, the economy grow. Uh, and they don't because they're adding to the overhead, not to uh, the real economy. Uh, and that basically is what is uh, the profit creating the austerity today uh, and has left uh, a debt, uh, an overhead. The basic uh, uh, premise of what I've been uh, saying in uh, the Bubble and Beyond book is that the debts that can't be paid won't be. That seems obvious enough. The, what is up for grabs is how won't they be paid. There are two ways of not paying them. One is to write down debts to what can be paid. That was what uh, uh, President Obama promised to do and what he has broken his promise on by uh, following his Wall Street uh, campaign contributors. The other way is uh, to sell, uh, to force uh, sell-offs, uh, a huge sell-off of property. That is what the European Union is insisting that Greece and uh, Spain and other countries do to somehow uh, privatize uh, their basic infrastructure and instead of providing it freely to the economy or at a subsidized rate to uh, make the users of roads, uh, uh, toll roads and other uh, public utilities uh, pay interest, dividends, exorbitant salaries, uh, generate uh, uh, capital gains. And all of this is going to be counted in the uh, national income and product accounts as output, uh, but it really should be treated as overhead. Thank you.